as I looked at the story this morning about Sharia compliant vacations. Oh, I'm not kidding you. I've got the pictures up. If you want to go, go to my Facebook page, ASAP. You can take a look at this. It is a uh, apparently a Muslim man and a child on board a jet ski. And you think, well, what's the big deal? Well, sitting in back of them is a woman dressed head to toe in a black burqa on the jet ski. And to Egypt now, there's, a, there's an agency now peddling Sharia-compliant vacations in Egypt. I know you think I'm joking. I'm not. You go to uh, the Jeff Katz uh, Facebook page. You can take a look at that. Uh, former Congressman Fred Grandy, I'd imagine, has already booked his vacation and uh, has packed his burqa. He's ready to go. He's also with us on a regular basis. Hey, Fred, good morning. Well, it wasn't me that was on vacation last week. Can That's you true. completely confirm where you were and what you were wearing <laughs> at the time? Don't I w- lay this on me. <laughs> I was modeling the Burke on the back of my jet ski, you bet. Absolutely. By the way, in, in connection with that, before we get into the main stuff I wanted to talk about, did you know that there is also now, I believe, a television network based in Cairo that is completely staffed by women in full burqa so that you cannot see their face or their hands. Oh, my gosh. It is nothing but women dressed entirely in black. Now, I suppose the good news about that is if they ever have a power failure, you won't be able to tell the difference because everything is pretty much black already. Yikes! Uh, but, uh, no, this is, uh, this is apparently a new Sharia-compliant television station run oh. by women, but you can't really tell because they're covered from head to toe. Incredible. It's incredible. Fred, well, if you, if you like that, you yeah. will love this. All right. Um, now, as you probably know, it is somewhat quiet down here on the battlefield of the um, Freedom Five, or as Newt Gingrich has now started calling them, the National Security Five, Michelle Bachman and company, are um, essentially not being taken to task too much for mm-hmm. their letters to the inspectors general. Uh, and so really what we're looking at right now are some of the stories that uh, drew their attention to requesting these kinds of investigations. Now, you probably know there was some scuttlebutt about Michelle Bachman perhaps having to lose her seat on the Intelligence Committee. That apparently is not going to happen. Okay. And and I think maybe one of the reasons, Jeff, and I'm just speculating, is that there are now, in addition to the, um, the examples they cited in their letters, more stories developing, and I don't know if we have talked about this one individual, but I thought this would be instructive as to why they're doing what they're doing and why it needs to be done. Mm-hmm. Have we talked about Louis Safi at no. all? No, no, no. All right, he's an interesting character. Right now, Louis Safi has a pretty good job. He is the new director of the political office for the Syrian National Council, which is essentially the Muslim Brotherhood outfit <laughs> that is opposing Bashar Assad in Syria, uh, and, and rightly or wrongly is um, trying to work through the Syrian Free Army to uh, depose uh, um, Assad. Now, they are based in Doha, Qatar, and that's not just by accident. If you're there, uh, you, you receive, and they have received, the full endorsement of Yusuf Karadawi, who is the spiritual leader of the Muslim Brotherhood. So mm-hmm, this, mm-hmm. this essentially now is the opposition, and Safi is their is their political mouthpiece. Now, here's how he trained for the job. Okay. As recently as 2009, Safi was a top advisor to the Pentagon in the United States, including one of the two eminent endorsers of the Muslim chaplain program. So he at least had some oversight over all of the Muslim chaplains that are put into the military Mm -hmm. to provide counsel. In addition, he was also, in 2009 teaching the theology of Islam, coincidentally, at Fort Bliss, when Major Nadal Hassan (laughs) committed his atrocities. Now, (laughs) shortly after that, it was discovered that Louis Safi, as a full-fledged member of ISNA, an unindicted co-conspirator, probably was not the right guy for that (laughs) position. But but his his, uh, resume goes even further back. In 2000. Five, he himself was an unindicted co-conspirator in the trial of convicted terrorist Samuel Aryan, who was a member of Palestinian Islamic Jihad. He was wiretapped by the FBI in conversations, but by 2009 he was appearing with the FBI in outreach programs, uh, essentially doing public relations for um, the Muslim community and the FBI. Now, all of this is by way of illustrating why it is necessary to check how these people get in and out and around the government. Because one of the things that we have learned 
is that when people are vetted, when they're considered for government posts, whether they have security clearances or not, they have what they call adjudicatory guidelines. This is, this is the criteria that they use for how you get into the government. Mm-hmm. But it's all subjective, Jeff. Okay. In other words, it is a judgment call. And if that's true, then it's not hard to understand how a guy like Safi moves in and out of the government, or for that matter, Huma Abedin, who, yep. of course, has yep. caused the most controversy. And by the way, we've discovered um, Huma Abedin herself had an interesting position between 1996 and 2008. She was the assistant editor of a magazine called the Institute of Mu- Muslim Minority Affairs Journal, which is owned and operated by a guy named Abdullah Omar Nasif, who has been identified as having connections with Osama bin Laden and may have even helped plan the 9-11 attacks. Oh. So, so I, I'm, just, I'm laying this out here yeah. as a way of saying it is high time that people like Michelle Bachman and her colleagues asked for and received answers from the government as to why they are cooperating, collaborating, and in some cases actually relying on the judgment of people like Louis Safi and others. Hey, let me ask you, Fred, before uh, before we wind this all up, uh, Mitt Romney stands in Jerusalem and says it's great to be here in the capital of Israel and then says, uh, by the way, Palestinians, if you really wanted to do something with that, maybe you take a look at the culture uh, that lives here in Israel. He's being dismantled, terrible, terrible gaps, and I sat back thinking, wow, he went two for two. Yeah, well, I, I think that that was not um, by accident. Yeah. I, I think he is probably trying to reassert his bona fides with the hopefully the American Jewish community, which unfortunately, as you probably know, is all over the map when it comes to this kind of stuff. Yeah. But, but reasserting yourself against the Palestinian Authority is something I wish more of our leaders would do, because the, uh, the accommodations and appeasements we have made have pretty much led us to the situation we're in right now, which I would have to say is pretty damn unstable. <laughs> There's, there's the understatement of the day. Yeah. We'll leave it at that one. Former Congressman uh, Fred Grandy, good stuff.